Vriende, baie welkom vanavond, ek dink voordat ons, voor ons begin, kom ons erken die grootheid van die Heere, en ons gaan bid om, ons praat met om, dis ons hy wat ons by mekaar bring vanavond, en kom ons aan bid om net, vir wie hy is, wat hy vir ons doen, vir sy liefde, hoe meer ek bewus raak waar ek vanavond kom, hoe meer dankbaar word ek vir waar jy in die Heere my vat. En het is makkelijk om het te kan sê, maar wanneer mens in die moeilijkheid is, en jy het pijn, en ons krijg zwaar, stoe jy moet goed, Volgende zondag gaan ek net so advertentiekie. Volgende week gaan ek begin met gesels op Salom 73, die van jou wat kyk daarna. En uh, die onderwerp wat ek gaan hanteer, is die, die vraag wat ek lok en sê, wat nou? Wat nou? So dan het jy saad op die mekaar in ons leven, dan sê ons, wat nou? En bid asjeblief vir my, kop ons nog lekker die mekaar, wat ons bykie richting kry, maar kom ons bid net saam. Heere, wanneer ons jou aanbid in die aand, aanbid ons hier as die vader, Ons aan bid is die Seen en ons aan bid is die Heilige Gees. En ons aan bid die Heere vanuit die lichaam, die kinder, om daar die te herken, die bring ons by mekaar. Daarom vraag ons, as ons vanavond so gesels met mekaar, ons gaan luister na, 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 na ons ou vriend, die Thomas, dat die vir ons hulle help, Heere, om bewust te wees van hierdie speciale afspraak vanavond. Ons harte is oop, ons luister wat die vir ons sê, en ons bring hulde aan eerst die koning, wat iwers in ons levens vir ons kom leer het van liefde, dat die vir ons aangeneem het, die ons kinders gemaakt, en ons die vorig gee, ons die mag gegeet om die kinders te kan wees. En vandag kyk ons terug, en ons is so dankbaar van waar jy ons kom haal het, en ons ere jyre vir hierdie oomlik, ons is hier, en ons is so dankbaar jyre, dat jy ook saam met ons is. Ons ere daarvoor, help ons jyre om verzichtig te wees, moet dit tot ons vanavond hoor ook. Spreek ons aan, kom verander ons levens as het lief vanavond, Heere. Amen, amen. So those of you that are here for the first time tonight, you, uh, we, we had the privilege to listen to uh, Dr. Thomas McCuddy, um, and he will introduce himself further, and also tell us there's two sessions tonight, he'll explain the second session as well, and we had quite a challenge here this morning, He's the president of the Families of Virtue and um, Johan Grobler from uh, Apologetics South Africa. So, so we're thankful uh, for you as well, my brother, that you that you brought him in for us. This morning, the, the one thing that touched my heart was the, the fact that we need to listen more. We need to listen and ask questions. I'm going to share something with you without incriminating myself. <laughs> so, our sons, I got the twins, they went to the school for the first time in their life, grade whatever that was, the very, very first one, and then they came home very eagerly, and they wanted to see me in the study. Uh, Wendy was in the kitchen, busy with preparing food for the evening, and they came to the study, and they asked me this question, and I didn't know how to answer it. They asked me, Dad, how were we born? How were we born? And um, get, catching my breath, I looked at all the books on my shelf. I said, what, what am I going to show them? How am I going to explain this? They're so small, not you know, how? So I did what a father does. You must always remember this, brothers, when you are to have children, you, you send them to their mother. Ga vraag jou ma. So she goes to, to, the, to the mother, and, the, and, and, and Wendy is, well, she's also blown, and she does what the mother does well. Go ask your father. <laughs> in the meantime, she thinks. And I'm stumbling and I don't know what to do. And I send them back to their mother. And as they get to their mother, their mother asks the, the, the following. They, they, she just says, why? You know, the, ask the question, why? Before you answer it, before you take out all the books and try and stumble all over your words, you don't know what to say. And then one says, you know, <clears throat> there's a guy there called John in the school. And he was born almost blind. He's got this thick glasses on. 
They just want to know whether they're born okay. You know, is there, is there anything funny? <laughs> so when he says, no, you had all your toes and your fingers, you're fine, no problem. And there they were happy and they were going. Can you imagine if I took out my book and they were standing there, not listening and asking the questions? So that you know what it's all about into their realm and what was bugging them. And thank you for this morning. It was such a blessing. And I would like to come up here. I don't want to waste time tonight. Uh, so, so Thomas is going to talk to us. Uh, Tom, th there are two Thomases. The other one is Quackenbush. He's, he's, he's a bit ill. So Thomas, you're going to take both the sessions. And really we enjoy it this morning. And may the Lord bless you with us here tonight. Okay. Thank you. Right. Good evening. Yeah, so we have two sessions tonight. We're going to go for about 45 minutes or so, uh, maybe a little bit longer, but I can adjust the second one since uh, I'm riding solo tonight. So yes, yeah, just continue to be in prayer for Thomas. I had the bug last week, and so we're just swapping these uh, two sickly Americans uh, and enjoying our time here. So tonight gets to be a little bit more informal. Tonight gets to be a little bit more, um, you know, it's this morning, we got services, and I was getting to know you, you're getting to know me, and you're the crowd that came back. So I'm excited to be with you this evening. And we really got two goals tonight. We want to talk about what it means to raise godly men and women, and, and the concept of discipleship and the role that virtue plays in that. And then we're going to examine the role of the father specifically, and because uh, fatherlessness is a is a huge problem uh, in both our nations, and so it's really kind of focused in what what is this concept of the virtuous family, and and how does this work, and um, just a little bit about us because I didn't share so much. Families of virtue. We started about two years ago. I served in uh, pastoral ministry some form for about twenty years. I've served 13 years as a professor, it'll be 13 years this August, as a professor uh, of apologetics at a Bible college in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and um, my whole ministry was how to make disciple makers. How do I do this? And that's why when in all my studies, this concept of virtue that I really stumbled on probably at the end of 2019, uh, I've, been, I've been learning apologetics, learning all these things since 2003, so 20 years ago. But only in about 2019, I stumbled across this concept and realized this is, this is old. This is not new. And we've, we abandoned this philosophically. I understand why, I understand how. And so our ministry exists to sort of reclaim this because it's what's missing. It's the missing component of discipleship. It's the missing component in our families. It's the missing component in our sanctification process. That God made us to be virtuous, but we don't use that language, do we? We don't talk about them that much. One thing I learned that I'm up here is like I'm nearly blind. I can barely see y'all. So if you're going to shake your head, I need to see big movements. Some of you who are, they, they yeah, see, I can see it now. Okay. So, um, no, no, you're good. It, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's just, it's just funny because my first time I got up here, I'm like, <laughs> I can't, I don't, there's people I know because I can hear the breathing. So, um, like I said, we're, we're going to have some fun tonight, but we, we started this ministry our, our whole purpose, how can we walk alongside believers? How can we be, as disciple makers, um, what we needed when we, were, when we were looking? How can we partner? How can we minister? And being from America, you know, we have the big ministries, we have all the stuff, and I said, you know, me and, and Thomas Quackenbush, we said, we can do a lot when um, almost taking a cue from uh, being living in Fayetteville, we have Fort Bragg. So if you've ever seen the movie Rambo, you know the movie Rambo? At least you know the movie. Okay, thank you. And um, at the very beginning, he talks about the boys on Bragg. That's us. That's the Airborne. That's the Special Forces, the crazies. And half of them, like most of them, go to our churches. They're, they're saturated. We learn from them that a small group can do so much more sometimes than the whole force. And so we said, how can we be the clay that molds to the needs of the people? How can we help families? How can a desperate mom, desperate dad, when they, they need help, how can we minister to them? That's why we exist. And that's why in some ways we've come to South Africa and we realize there's a lot of people who need help. And uh, so again, for, for those of you that want 
the PowerPoints, the things we're offering. At the end of this presentation, there's a QR code. You can sign up, and once we're back and we got everybody signed up, we're going to send our 40 weeks of wisdom devotionals, a PDF, to everybody. We're publishing on South African soil so we can charge South African prices because so you guys don't have to pay to ship across the pond and pay the American prices. The, the book that we brought with us cost us 250 rand just to print, just to print. And so we found a printer who said, we can do it about 60 rand. And I said, that's everybody's happy. It's, it's amen. And that's what we want to do. We want to help. Uh, and that's why even in our classical Virtue Academy, when we put the link up there, we just finished up and set things up where we have a hidden site just for South Africans so you can join at South African prices. We want to help you. We, 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 don't, want to, we don't want to rob you. <laughs> But I always say, like, when you give into a ministry like ours, it always goes to feed hungry children, our hungry children. So bear that in mind. So we're going to talk about discipleship in the family. We're going to talk about how these concepts of virtue, we're going to look at them a little bit uh, deeper tonight. So as we think about the virtuous family, I think we can agree that we want our kids to grow up to be good people. Amen? You want your child to be a good person. What is that? What's a good person? We might say a good person is Jesus. Okay, so what is, what is Jesus like? Jesus is like a good person, and round and round we go. It's a fuzzy notion, and that's the problem. We, we sometimes have this notion. We, we want them to be good, but we don't know really what that means. And so we're lacking this specific and purposeful cultivation of character. It's in the, it's in the education system. Our education system is not geared towards cultivating character. Okay, America or South Africa, and I've been talking with a lot of South African teachers. And remember, I told you this morning, I've got education training. So I understand Bloom's taxonomy. I understand Eric Erickson, Piaget, Maslow. Like I read, I read all the stuff and I, I looked at it and it's all based upon a pragmatism, what works, and behavioral modification. It's based upon change the environment, you, get, you, you change the input, you get a different output. The whole education system, including Christian education, by the way, even in our churches, because that's all we know. And we've adopted it. We adopted a completely secular, atheistic philosophy of education, and we threw Jesus in the mix. And I can prove it. I can show it across, because even, even Bloom's taxonomy, which if those of you who are teachers, you know, oh, the objectives, they have to be written according to Bloom. Bloom, who's a raging atheist, who recognized that he didn't want to touch anything with character because there's no truth. Bloom's taxonomy rules the day. I have to help our Bible college keep accreditation. So I am fully aware of all these things. And in the church, we're not doing any better. We don't have a concept. We don't have a, a mode. We lack sometimes even just the, the language. So our goal is we're going to define what a good person is through the classic Christian virtues. And part of our mission is we're going to target the head of the home being the father. We're going to look at why and, and how the father uh, impacts this. And what I'm hoping, the vision, is we're going to spark something that changes your family forever. Because probably tonight, you're going to walk out with more questions than you walked in with, and that's a good thing. Because then you know you actually have questions. You have ways to go looking for the answer. And the thing about our ministries, we try to make it really simple to find those answers and to walk with people and train them. I have uh, one of the awesome things. Every group of parents I've been engaging, they said, how can we learn virtue? How can we immediately begin this? And they said, can you teach us? So we're starting a group in August that we're going to be doing virtually with as many parents as want to. And we're going to be doing, we're going to be training them in this. So you keep this in mind. If you're like, you'd like to know more, we're going to set up a group specifically for South Africans to make sure that we meet you in terms of your time zone. Because we're six hours, where I am, we're six hours behind you. So we, we keep that in mind. Um, and I put my money where my mouth is because John knows that there he is. I think yeah, that's, yeah, that's John. So, um, <laughs> When, uh, when at the Bible college, when, when John was leading the Bible college and the, the students were taking Greek and they were, there was a great weeping and gnashing of teeth and a, a great outcry went out from the students, um, I, I told them, I said, well, I can, I can help you guys, I can tutor. And they said, well, Thomas, we have to meet at 7 in the morning before our, our class at 8. I said, okay, that's 2 a.m., <laughs> sure. And uh, fri every Friday for weeks at 2 a.m., I got up or just stayed up, I just didn't go to bed, and, and I tutored Greek. For an hour for these guys. I put my money where my mouth is. We want to help. If that if you want the help, you like we're the ones like 
we want to stand in that gap. Our whole kind of philosophy, the principle we live by, how do we reach the pew? I know you're in chairs, but just pretend they're pews. How do you reach the pew? That's what we want to do. So as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, this, this issue, and I mentioned this morning, so I know some of you weren't there, so recap. Jesus warned us what we were going to be up against. He tells the parable of the soils, where uh, it's actually a sower, and he goes out, and there's four soils. And we know the hard soil, the seed hit and, and was taken away. There's the rocky soil. It grew up quickly. The sun scorched it. It died quickly. The thorny soil was choked, and the good soil produced a fruit. Now, as it relates with virtue that we talked about is the, uh, the hard soil, it says that this, these are the ones who did not understand, and that requires aspects of the intellect. That requires knowledge. That's an aspect of prudence. When you don't know the right thing to do, when you've got something, you don't know what to do it, you're lacking prudence. So people who have, who have cultivated vices where they are imprudent and their mind is literally trained to not receive what is right in front of them, they're going to be that hard soil. You're going to tell them what is, and they're not even going to be able to see it. And I think we live in a culture that we understand, like it's almost like the, like when people ask, well, and again, in my country, you know, we had a very high-ranking official. They asked her, uh, you know, can you tell us what a woman is? And she says, I'm not a biologist. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Like, like, really? You have to be a biologist to understand what a woman is? You should just be able to, to recognize. Like, I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple different ways we could go about this, but why is your mind not capable of receiving the reality that's in front of you to understand these things? It's hard soil. The, the rocky soil had no root, and we grew up, the Greek, uh, actually, the Greek uses a word that connects with the English word scandalize. It was scandalized. It had no root in itself. It lacked fortitude. It lacked the ability to withstand the difficulties to achieve what is true. The thorny soil cares of the world. That's a temperance issue. That's a self-control. It wants the stuff. It had, its appetites are what drive it. It had no ability to moderate its passions. I want all these other things more than I want what is true and good. The good soil produced a fruit and this, this crop that it produced, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you owe when, when God's word comes in. You, the, you are created for good works. That's justice. Giving to God what is due. All four cardinal virtues are present with the parable of the soils. Now, it appears other places as well. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. Peter, again, if you haven't read Peter recently, he begins this by, by letting him know, he says, you've got everything you need for godliness, but I've been reminding you this, and I keep reminding you, and Peter says, I'm basically, I'm about to die, and I've set up people to remind you when I'm gone. And what he reminds him, he says, make every effort to add to your faith virtue. And that Greek is arete. It is the same word Aristotle uses, same concept. And actually, the, the Greek is a little um, clearer than the English. The English add to your faith uh, virtue and, with, uh, and virtue with knowledge. It's actually add with faith virtue, meaning it comes parts and parcel. With faith should come this virtue. And with this virtue comes knowledge. And with this knowledge, self-control. With this self-control, steadfastness. With this steadfastness, godliness, and brotherly affection. With that, also love. And Peter says, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, you will not be ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Which tells me that it is possible to be ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That you can truly love Jesus and be unfruitful and ineffective. And the reason is because you don't have those qualities. And what really struck us, because this is our ministry verse, Knowledge is prudence. You have to know what to do. Self-control is temperance. Steadfastness is fortitude. Godliness and brotherly affection is justice. It's giving to God what is due, and it's giving to others what is due, and it's all wrapped up in love, which motivates all the virtues. And I said, there they are again, the cardinal virtues. They keep popping up in Scripture. And so what we began to understand is we said, you know what? If we start cultivating these virtues, well, according to Peter, 
That's how you're going to live effectively. That's how you're going to live a fruitful life. That's how you're going to live effectively and fruitful in Christ. And I said, you know what? That's everywhere. That's your family. That's your church. Most church hurt. Isn't that most church? Can it be church hurt and, and problems in a church? Can't we boil us down to one of these four issues? Somebody did something bonehead, okay, right? Or somebody was, you know, um, couldn't control themselves, lack of self-control, fear, or they did something unjust. They were unfair. Isn't that what boils down to most of our church problems? If we cultivate these four things, if they are yours and increasing, then you will be, you won't be ineffective and unfruitful. And the thing is, it's also a command. He says, you make, it's, a, it's imperative. So for those of you, the, the grammar people out there, my kindred, okay, I like grammar. He gives a, an imperative. So most of you, that means it's a command. You make every effort. That does not mean the Holy Spirit is absent, okay? That's like me, I should make every effort to love my wife, but the Holy Spirit helps me and carries me along when I fail. So this is not us doing it on our own. This is not the path to legalism. This is not us earning anything from our salvation. This is us receiving Christ because it begins with faith. Because he doesn't say make every effort to get faith. He says make every effort to add to your faith, assuming you've already got that faith in Christ. You've already got that Holy Spirit. This is how you're supposed to grow. And if we see this in our families, we're going to see virtuous families. That means we're going to have strong families that are going to bear fruit, and we're going to see strong churches. It's what will change the face of the church. And I look at this, and I said, this is not new. This is not a gimmick. I'm like, it's been there in the text the whole time. But we lost it. We forgot what these things are. So to expand these out, the, the three kinds of virtues that we seek to develop, they fall into three basic categories. The first is intellectual virtue. Its object is truth, the mind's ability to receive what is. And this is where we love the Lord with your mind. This is why apologetics is so powerful. It helps us understand the things of God. And uh, on the 6th, we're doing um, a conference somewhere in this general vicinity of, of I don't know, like I just, I, we can drive to it. That's all I know. So again, I know, I know like on a globe, I can like point, I can find it. Um, but part of what I'm going to be speaking on are things like papyri to iPad. How did we get our English Bible? What's the history of it? And why can we trust it? Do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? Pretty important, right? That's a big deal. It's going to be um, biblical justice or social justice. What are those issues between those? And uh, Thomas Quackenbush will also be speaking on um, the virtuous discipleship there as well, and just like or virtuous apologetics, how this how this operates and connects together. Well, we're gonna we're gonna teach people how to love God with their mind. We're gonna try to help them understand what these things are. And what happens in our churches many times, and with you guys, again, you, you collect all the bad ideas that America spews forth. So in the 1800s, uh, we had this thing called the uh, anti-intellectual movement. It was not an official movement, it just sort of happened. As the sciences grew and as uh, modernity was, was raging, people withdrew into their sanctuaries just to stick to their Bible studies. And this is what allowed Darwin... Charles Taz Russell, Jehovah Witnesses, and Joseph Smith, Mormons, to run rampant unchecked because the church withdrew from the marketplace of ideas. And because of that, what we have now is we have a, a lot going on in our churches where people just say, uh, they, they have in practice, I don't have to use my mind. And I'm like, God made you in his image. He gave you a rational soul. And he expects you to use that. That is what distinguishes you from all other creatures under the sun. No animal can do what you do when it comes to your ability to reason. And that's why when we don't use our minds, when we, when we neglect that as part of our faith, we are dishonoring God. We are taking the talent he has given us and we're burying it in the sand. We're saying, I don't need this gift you've given me. I'm going to bury this and I'm just going to let your Holy Spirit do everything. It would be the equivalent of me looking at my wife and saying, you know what, um, I'm just going to sit back and let the Holy Spirit love you. It's okay to laugh at that. Most of you, that will work just as well as you think it would. And we wouldn't do that, right? We wouldn't do that to our spouses, but we're going to look at God and say, you know what, God, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to let you do it. When he's called us to faithfulness, and he's called us in this case to use our minds. 
And I think what happens, we like, well, look what happens when people use their minds. They come up with bad ideas. I was like, that's them not using their minds. If they were, if they were not, cre- if they were, the fallacies weren't there, if they understood things, they wouldn't think those things. That's, the, that's a bad use of a good mind. We want to use our minds correctly, and that brings honor to God. There are moral virtues, and the object is action. This is where you must do things. Justice, fortitude, and temperance fall under this. This is where you love God with your strength. You have to do something. That when I'm going to show justice to somebody, I have to do something. I have to, like, engage them. I have to, if I'm going to practice fortitude, I have to use my strength. Uh, I was telling how when I was in uh, Nepal, I was in Nepal in 2020, and uh, I caught the flu. So let me, let me make sure you understood that. This is the year 2020, March of 2020, and I caught the flu in Nepal. So that's why I end up, people were like throwing my food at the end of the hallway and I had to go get it because everybody thought I had COVID. COVID was heading that way. I had to delay my trip and I'm sitting there in this dorm. Classes are canceled. I'm watching Facebook. I'm watching everything shut down. I'm watching the U.S. run out of toilet paper. I took a whole suitcase of toilet paper home from Nepal. They asked me, they're like, do you not have toilet paper in your country? It's like, apparently not. And I was the savior of my household. Everybody's like, we had toilet paper. Anyway, um, so there I am, and I, I remember thinking, because uh, at this point, 2020, again, 2019, virtue comes on my radar, so I'm learning virtue. I'm going through this again, and I'm sitting there, and, I, and I'm freaking out because I'm like, I got 104 fever Fahrenheit, not Celsius. You know, Celsius, you're dead. But uh, <laughs> I had 104 fever. I don't know what that is in Celsius. It's hot. It's bad. Um, 105, you're in the hospital, okay? So I'm at 104, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? And I remember thinking to myself, there is only one way to cultivate fortitude. You have to endure the difficulties. So what am I going to do? And actually, the way I cultivate it, my action, loving the Lord and my strength, is to take him at his word and not worry about it. And to sit there and quit freaking out. Every time a plane, I heard a plane in the air, I said, praise Jesus, planes are still flying. And I left Friday afternoon, I forget the exact date. But uh, at, uh, I, I left at 8, well, actually 8.30 at night, 8.30 p.m. At midnight, they grounded all planes. Barely got out. Yeah. Fortitude, temperance, self-control. You have to take action. But there's also these theological virtues. The object is God. This is where we love the Lord with your heart. Faith, hope, and love. These things are given by God. The object is God. Faith, when it involves other people, is trust, and that's an aspect of justice. But faith, when it revolves with God, isn't justice. There's something else that there. This, this, this involves an act of the Holy Spirit. So this is why I say when it comes to virtue, there is this, uh, we define virtue, it's the good qualities of soul that are directed towards the good, meaning they always have to be pointed at what is good, and they're perfected by God. That's what it means to be virtuous. These three categories are what make us, again, virtuous. Now, you may not be able to see so much here. Uh, Again, this is the kind of thing that later on, if you sign up on our mailing list, I'll send you this graphic. This is our teaching tree. Now, what is that? That's power. I don't have a laser, do I? It wouldn't matter. That's a TV. Wouldn't work. Okay, so when it comes to virtue, when you look at it, the trunk gives us our moral and intellectual virtue. We intertwined it specifically to show that you can't use the head without the, you can't be intellectual without moral and moral without intellectual. If you're intellectual without being moral, your mind, no no action, the error of Solomon. God-given wisdom, but he didn't apply it. To be moral without the intellect is to be zealous without knowledge. You have a form of godliness, but you deny its power. You need both of them. The branches off to the side, so from the intellectual side, we have the five classic intellectual virtues. The first three on the bottom, wisdom, knowledge, and intellect. Intellect is that understanding, that ability to see and perceive the the ideas, the concepts, and knowledge is where, almost like what you learn in logic, where you can make a rational inference and you can go to other ideas. This is why logic is so hard for adults who have never been trained, and they get so frustrated, and they're like, why can't I do this? And it's, you're at the level of intellect and knowledge. Your mind is not trained to, to make those, those bridges, and we have to strengthen it to do that. 
And then when your mind does that at the lower level, you can raise it to the highest principles, the broadest concept to see the ultimate foundation, and that is found in Sophia wisdom. That is God. Knowledge of God is true wisdom, and that's why the more we understand Christ, who is the wisdom of God, we understand us, the world, and everything else. The other two, prudence and art, those are practical intellectual virtues. Artistry is an intellectual virtue. Those who play guitar, there you are. Yeah, so guitar players, that's art. That's knowing how to produce what is good and true and beautiful. It's why when you have uh, singers who sing songs that are raunchy, there's nothing beautiful about that. There's no virtue. They might be skilled, but there's no virtue. The artisans who know how to make beautiful things, or sometimes I see, um, I see things that people have made, and I just get so so enthralled. It's like it's so well made when when somebody does that. That's so good, and that's why if you buy, uh, I think we were talking about how you have the, uh, we call them Dollar Trees uh, back home, but I think you call them like the Chinese stores, like everything's from China, and and it's junk, like not even things Chinese would buy, like it's awful, it falls apart. There's no artistry there, you know, like you buy it and it's already broken. Okay, it's like if it actually works, you're, you're confused because like, it's not supposed to do that. So that's part of what it means to be virtuous. And the prudence is, is knowing what is good and knowing how to achieve that. And the reason why we've shortchanged our kids in school is because we're only focused on their artistry, their vocation and what they can do. And we leave out three of the five intellectual virtues. And that's why they're coming out of America and South, and, and, and South African schools with no intellectual virtue. They know how to do something. But when they get in a situation where that one thing they know how to do doesn't apply, they're helpless. And what they often lack too, they lack the moral virtues, which is why even if they know how to do it really well, they can be poor workers. And then with the moral virtues, that's your, your temperance, your fortitude, your justice. Again, those things of, of justice, giving what is due and knowing what that is. The, the fortitude, that courage, the ability to endure for what is good, and your temperance, being able to moderate your passions. God has given us desires, and when we orient those desires to the wrong object or the wrong intensity, we become it, that's a vice. We've taken a good thing, we've made it bad. And so this is why, even when it comes to justice, you, you look at that and why I speak on the social justice movement is because the UN wrote a, wrote a little paper, and it's about 200-something page document. First couple of pages, it specifically says that if you believe, okay, quote, if you believe in absolute truth and the classic idea of justice, you are no friend of the social justice movement. And that's coming out of the UN. So we want to get to the classic idea of justice, which is, we maintain, the biblical idea of justice. That's why we don't understand God in our world, because we've redefined justice. And by the way, that word for justice in the Greek, dikai sune, last time you, next time you're reading Greek, you see it? Same word for righteousness. Same word. The concepts differ a little bit when you use it in English, but it's the same, you, can, you, you see it both, both ways, justice and righteousness. Well, all those virtues are nurtured by faith, hope, and love. We put them as the roots because that's where they draw their nourishment. That's what it means to be truly virtuous. You can have a form of virtue, and even the pagans can do this. The pagans spend all their time at the top part of the tree, and what Aristotle and since classical Greek, they did not know, they did not know faith, hope, and love, and the true God. They understood human nature, top part of the tree, but they did not understand the human maker, and that's what the roots connect us to. You with me? Okay. Now, some of you saw this this morning, so for those of you who saw it, this is, uh, again, a little bit of a repeat, but I want to I make this point. I want to try to drive this home. Some of our motivation for this, and, and now this makes a little bit more sense, we have our virtue, and there's three kinds of virtues, intellectual, theological, moral, our, um, our cardinal virtues, and all the virtues you saw on the tree are placed around that. And the point we make is that as we cultivate these virtues in our family, we win all the fruits of the Spirit. It begins moving us in that direction. 
Because if you're going to be self-controlled, but you have vices where you're self-indulgent, then the Holy Spirit is, it's like the Holy Spirit is, is hitting hard soil. It's not able to produce that good fruit. And when you, when you want to have gentleness, when you want these kinds of things, the, the virtues are what God has made us by nature. He has given you a mind by nature to reason. Amen? Yet the Holy Spirit can also illumine such that he can reveal truth you would not have otherwise recognized. Amen? But if you're not spending any time looking at the scriptures, how is he supposed to illuminate them? He can miraculously, but I, will, I would often say, like uh, Moses, when, when God told Moses, he says, Moses, go out in the water, stick your staff in the water, and I'll split the water. Now, what if Moses has said, I'm not getting in the water? See, that's how I am with your water here. Like, I don't swim in the ocean, okay? Because God made fish with teeth, okay? <laughs> so um, I, get, I get ridiculed for it, don't care. I live, and, and that's what matters. Um, so, so I'm one of those, like, I'm, I'm not getting in the water. Like, it would take an act of God. If God said, get in the water, like, I would do it because I trust him. But if God says, if God doesn't say, I'm not going because I can't. Like, first time I ever got in the ocean, my feet disappeared, my heart rate jumped, my wife has pictures of me rolling in the shallow water just so I can be wet because I just psychologically knew, no, can't do it. God tells Moses, go out in the water. So Moses goes out in the water, sticks his staff in the water, the water's part. God does not look at Moses and say, good job for parting the water. But he had to be obedient to get in the water, did he not? God tells Moses, speak to the rock so water will come forth. What did Moses do? He threw a hissy fit. Do you guys have that in South Africa? You know what I'm talking about? Hissy fit? Some of you are like, did he cuss? What is that? Like a hissy fit where you just get really up. You're just mad. You're just upset. You're frustrated. He smacks the rock. God still brought forth the water because Israel needed it. He told Moses, you will not enter the promised land. God calls us to join him in what he's doing. And the virtues are that vehicle that make us the kind of person that disposes us to obedience. But he wants to see the fruit of spirit in our lives. Virtue is the path to get us there. And as mentioned, that's me hitting the wrong button. Go the other way. The Beatitudes are all connected to the virtues. Everything that involves the virtues, if we, if we want to have the blessed life, then the virtue helps us get there. And one of the neat things when, when, when I studied this, when I looked at it, Aristotle and the, the Greeks, they had this Greek word called eudaimonia, which is their word. It's difficult to translate in English. Some people translate it as happiness, but that's a cheap word in English, more like human flourishing. The Latin theologians came along and they said, well, eudaimonia, we have a word for that, beatitus. It's where we get beatitudes. Blessed are, that's the Greek word, eudaimonia, the same way the Greeks understood to have the truly flourishing, blessed human life through the virtues, God, I would maintain in his word, agrees, and he said it's so much more when the Holy Spirit is involved. But when we turn our backs on what God has given us naturally, he can miraculously pick that up. Just like, you know, you, you think, well, what does it take to learn the Bible? Well, you got to learn how to read, right? Okay, so if I want to read the Afrikaans Bible, you know what I got to do? I got to learn Afrikaans. What's well, so Afrikaans? I was, I was corrected earlier. It's not Afrikaans. See, I bought this shirt from Old Khaki. I know you, you, you call it Old Car Keys. I get that. I bought this from Old Khaki, okay? So, so when you, if I want to learn and read the, the Afrikaans Bible, then I've got to learn the language, God can give me the language miraculously, amen? I mean, he did it at Babel, and it stuck, and he did it temporarily at Pentecost. I mean, I understand this is, this is all a part of the game. Like, he can. And how, think about this. Think if I, if I come and I'm like, Lord, I'm going to work in South Africa, but you know what? I'm just so busy. I can't learn Afrikaans. So, Lord, I'm just going to, you're just going to have to give me the language. And I would imagine he's like, no, I give you, I give you AfrikaansPod101.com. Like, I got that. I got, I got a book on phrases. Like, the Lord has given me so many resources. There's no reason I can't learn this language on my own. 
He could, I don't deny that one bit, and that would be super nice, but I recognize the work is, is on me to learn the language if I'm going to use it. He's given me the ability. And, and we were just having that conversation. I was like, you know, after I've studied, you know, to, to utilize languages like Latin, Spanish, Mandarin, Greek, Hebrew, I'm studying German with my kids right now. Um, I like languages. So what excuse do I have? We're going to just throw Afrikaans right in the mix. Why not? He's given me the mind to do it. And so I can take the natural gifts. I can utilize that. And he's going to bless that and use that in ways I could never do it on my own. Now, just in case you need more motivation, casting the vision for virtue, and then we're going to apply this with fathers, okay? Because again... This whole graphic, this is what we teach in our Virtue 101. We go through this whole thing, okay? We go through the outline of virtue, Virtue 102, 3, 4, cardinal, intellectual, theological virtues. We have four classes, eight weeks each, each, for the purpose of expanding these, because you're looking at this like, this is a lot. It is. I'm I'm, I'm throwing 32 weeks of course material at you, okay? I understand that. But I'm casting that vision. I'm trying to show you there's so much, and it's so rich, and it will change your life because it's changed my family. It's changed the life and how we operate. But here's, I'm going to give you one more motivation. I sat in a terminal in um, Michigan one day, and I thought to myself, I wonder how much, when, when Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. What is encompassed in that all? So I began casually going through the epistles, finding out, well, how many commands, what all is all. What, what, what do we got? It's, this is only 240. It's all I could fit on the slide. There's more. There's more. 240 commands from Romans, in this case, about 1 Peter. Because if you, because I know you can read it, right? The very first one, I even put the verse number, uh, Romans 12, 1, living sacrifice. That's a command. You know, be living sacrifice. Renew the mind. Be kind, no malice, patience, correct with gentleness, endure evil, be quick to hear, slow to anger, no hypocrisy. It, it, nothing should surprise you. Here you go. It's not, well, this isn't all, but do you feel hopeless at this point? You're like, how am I supposed to do all that? I can't even read that from where you are. Some people, when they get the PowerPoint, I can't even read it on the PowerPoint. I sat there, I laid them all out, and I said, All of these are commands, and all of our human actions, when we engage the will and we do what's good, that's the moral virtues. It's the cardinal virtues. I said, is it the case that every single command in Scripture can be tied to a virtue? Same list, reorganized. Same exact list. Fortitude, justice, prudence, temperance. It's alphabetical order. Every single command in the New Testament, every single command in the Gospels, every single command in Scripture, everything we're supposed to do to live in obedience to Jesus Christ can fall into four virtues. Now, when we cultivate these four virtues, it predisposes us. It gives us the kind of character that when we come down to a specific command, we are already moving in that direction. Why is it so difficult when you tell your kids to clean the room and they just don't want to clean the room? Well, if they just already have these vices where they're they're lazy, which, well, let's just call it what it is, that we want to be lazy, or if they just have something else that they really want to do, and they are so accustomed to doing that, that is their habit, that is their vice, then when you tell them, they're just not interested. You got to cultivate that. You got to grow that. You got to make that where uh, the, the same thing would happen to me. It took me 20 years to get to the place where when my, my wife and I were married, uh, we've been married 22 years. When we first married, I hate dishes, okay? Dishes are the devil. It all fits together. Um, I despise it, hated it. My wife wants me to do dishes. I'm like, that is not in the wedding vows. Like, you can't hold me to that. that there, there's, there's a, that's not in the contract. So... She wants me to wash dishes, and it's fine. I'll wash the dishes. I'm washing the dishes in a very unvirtuous manner. And I also learned that if I wash them badly, I don't have to because she doesn't want me to wash the dishes. So, again, no virtues involved. My, I'm doing the dishes. My wife is like, well, you have a bad attitude. And I said, but I'm washing the dishes. She said, I want you to want to wash the dishes. 
You ask too much. Like, I, it took nigh 20 years. When my wife's back went out, she couldn't walk. I got the boys together. I said, we're going to wash the dishes. And I found myself, like, I, I didn't understand. Like, I, I enjoyed it. But not because it was dishes. No, give, don't get me wrong. I hate dishes still. But I was serving and loving my wife. All of a sudden, I had a quality of soul that was directed towards the good that God had perfected in me over two decades. I had gained a virtue of, of justice, giving what was due to my wife, helping her in the midst of her trial. And it brought me joy. That's the change that God can make through cultivating virtue. This is, and I didn't have words for it. I didn't have terms for it for the longest. But what happened is once I got the, these concepts, that expedited the whole process. And the same thing happens in my family. The same thing goes on when, uh, with, my, with my boys that when uh, we're, we're doing things, I'm, why do I have to clean my room? It's like, because that's justice. You owe it to your family. We, you owe it to us that we don't have to look at your dirty room. You need fortitude to do what is difficult. We use this. It's part of our language, and it's changed how our family functions. That's why, in a lot of ways, we started this ministry, because we want other families to experience what we've experienced and the freedom that comes from this. Now, one thing I want to do before we go into, I want to give you one other tool. So this is sort of kind of for free. I'm watching my time. I realize where I am. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to also introduce to you another concept. And this might be something you just have to pick up later because we teach, uh, we call it virtuous discipleship. How do we make disciple makers one-on-one -on -one, and how do we do this in our family? And so I know this is about the virtuous family and how does virtue fit into this? How does apologetics? What I did is I laid out and I said, you know what? There are eight steps, and I did this with a local pastor because I was evaluating his discipleship program. I laid out these eight, and I said, take any one away that you want to such that the Christian life will not be negatively impacted, such that you would still have a fully equipped disciple, and he realized you can't take any of them away. They're all critical. So I want to give you these eight steps real quick, then we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to roll and talk about fatherhood. Everybody good? Okay, I'm trying not to send the fire hose of knowledge, but um, our, our time is fleeting, and I want to honor your time. So eight steps, and again, I know you can like read these, so just follow me. First step is salvation. It involves three things. If you're going to raise up a child and you want to disciple them, we, are, we, we understand there's, there's a virtue there, but so all the virtues come into play in this sense because you need to understand salvation, intellectual virtue. You need to understand what that is. What is the gospel? What is justification, sanctification, glorification? I preach these three terms all the time in churches, and, and people act like they've never heard it before. And I said, it's all in Scripture. This is what it means to be saved, that justification is a salvation from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is salvation from the power of sin. It does not rule your life. And glorification is salvation from the presence of sin. You will no longer experience that. These are the promises given us in Scripture. You want to raise up a child, and you want to send them off when they go off to college, and you want them rooted, you've got to teach them this. And we're not doing this in our churches. We're not doing this in our families. The second step, and what I found that I always looked for was virtue. Because after someone comes to Christ, and again, you do this with your kids, but also you imagine somebody comes to Christ, they've never had any experience with the church, they've, they believe in Jesus, they've placed their faith in Jesus, but guess what? They have brought all the vices with them. And what we do is we're like, oh, you love Jesus now. And we just think that the Holy Spirit is going to miraculously change their heart. And what I've encountered with so many churches, I said, because so many churches have so many difficulties, you who have believed in Jesus for so long, you still bear those vices and you've never dealt with them. So we need to bring the virtues into play, into our discipleship. The third step involves the spiritual disciplines. And some of you, you read the Bible with your kids, you pray with your kids, but you're also struggling because they just don't seem interested in reading and they have trouble focusing in prayer. It's because you never cultivated those virtues of fortitude and temperance, okay? This is, this is directional. I actually use this as a pastor when I want to figure out where some ways derailed in their discipleship walk. I go step by step until I figure out where the problem is. Spiritual disciplines. There's seven. Seven key disciplines that are through Scripture. 
It involves meditating, memorizing scripture, reading and studying, confession, worship, fellowship, fasting, and prayer. Yeah, I already mentioned that one. So when, when we have these seven disciplines, that's going to that's gonna be what, that's what grows us spiritually. The virtues actually make us better human beings. So it means to be a good person, remember? Those are the kinds of characteristics we want. The spiritual disciplines unite us with God and help us grow in that relationship. And that's why what is natural, Paul talks about the natural man that doesn't desire the things of the Spirit, those vices pull us away. Fourth is study, hermeneutics. Learn how to observe, interpret, and apply the Bible. Churches often don't teach this. Like, it just falls off our radar sometimes. We don't think to teach people, here's how you inductively study the Bible. John Hrubler, can I get the right? Hrubler? Again, we don't make that sound like that's, that's, that's rude in America. So, um, so, so he's got a whole thing he does with apologetics essay and teaching inductive Bible study. It's amazing. You should learn how to get in there and understand the culture and let the Bible come to life. The things that were always there, they're not hidden. You just need the intellectual tools to, to pull those out. Then we go into theology, the 14 essential doctrines of the Christian faith. There are 14 doctrines that every Christian denomination that is an Orthodox Christian denomination, they all hold to these 14, and the Roman Catholics even hold to them as well. They don't deny any one of them. 14. I share this among pastors. They're like, we, we have no idea. Where did these come from? I said the first three creeds of the church where they declared what they believed, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Chalcedonian Creed. Come straight from them. 14 doctrines that I'm like, if, if, if a kid's going to come out of my house, they're going to know these things. They're going to grow. Where I'm going to share these with them. I'm going to make sure they get them. Next comes Apologetics. Once you learn the doctrines, once you learn Christianity, you got to understand apologetics. We take in our material a four cornerstone approach truth, God, Bible, Jesus. You got to know how to defend those areas. You got to know what those things are because that's what the world attacks. If they're going to really attack Christianity, it's going to fall into one of those four. Then you got to understand evangelism. And we talked about that this morning. And then you make disciple makers and you repeat that process. Which means what we do and what we teach churches how to do is we say, if you're going to be a, if you're going to spiritually reproduce, these are the eight steps. You get down to the last one, that discipleship. What happens is we take them back because we have a whole system of 24 principles of discipleship that guide us. One of the principles that I'll use here for, that's relevant for us is uh, what I learned in a country church. So you have to say it like a country American, okay? The principle goes like this. You can't give what you ain't got. And you got to open your mouth real big to do it. You can't give what you ain't got, meaning you cannot give to somebody else what you do not have. So you as parents, you look at this, you're like, I don't have some of these. You can't give them to your children then. You cannot give to your children what you do not possess. That's why I think one of the reasons parents many times do not disciple their children because they've never been discipled, they've never received. That's why I call you as parents, get that discipleship, or at least walk with your kids with it. Say, hey, like, like this is why I learn German with my kids, because I can say, you know, when we get together and we have German time, 15 minutes a day, my five-year-old, my eight-year-old, and my 12-year-old, we get to learn together, and it is special, and they hate missing it. Like, they're mad at y'all, because they're like, what are we supposed to do 28 days you're gone? What are we supposed to do for German time? I was like, just, just yell at each other in German. It's fun, you know, and just, you know, practice it. So like my five-year-old, all he can do is spool machine. I like, I was, he knows just dishwasher. That's all he's got. But he just goes around and calls his brother's dishwasher. But it's, it works. They love it. They, they, they're excited about it. They love, what, they love learning with daddy. How much more is you're walking with Christ that you can say that you as a family walk together and root it yourself in just simple eight key components of discipleship? This is what's missing from every family. This is what is missing with disciples across the board. I've seen it across whole churches. This is actually the very system we use. We send Nepali missionaries out into the field, and they use this to make disciple makers in churches that have zero resources, because it was actually a South African who asked me. He said, Thomas, 
actually, I can't say it the way South Africans say it. Thomas, and he says, I'm in the bush. I've got no power, which I guess you don't have to be in the bush to have that happen. But he was, I'm in the bush. I have no power. I have no resources. I am sitting under a tree, and I have people before me. How do I make disciples? That was August. All this came together. By Christmas, I had the manuscript. I said, now I know. I wrote the handbook that I said, with this and a Bible, you can make disciple makers with this. I said, this is what we're missing. And I would maintain in your, in your homes, what is it you should focus on? Where should you start? It needs to land in one of these eight. Until you get these covered, anything else, you're just going to be redoing what you've already done, or you're going to be leaving out something super important. It's the same way if you said, what does my child need to know before they leave off to college? They need to know how to dress themselves. Amen? <laughs> they need to know how to hygienate, and I got three boys, so I know that's low on their priority, but we still, we still fight that battle. Amen? They got to be clean. They should probably know how to cook. They should probably, again, we, we, they should drive, maybe work a job. Um, does my child need to know how to, like, spin wood and make wooden bowls? That's probably, that's nice, but that's not high in our priority. That's not really what I, you know, he might learn that one day, but that's not what I'm going to invest my time in. I've got, like, my key items, my wife included, things that she's like, boys, you need to be this and do this because one day we're going to have a daughter-in-law and she's going to curse our names because of the way you are, and we need to, like, situate this. And I look at that and I say the same thing, that if our boys go out and we release them to the world, I can look and I can know, I, I, I'm going to see things that are like, oh, we should have done that, but you know, we just didn't have time. But it, it's how horrible they go out and you know what, oh yeah, kind of forgot to teach them how to bathe. I mean, we look at that, we're like, well, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Of course everybody bathes. And I look at this and it was part of me, it's like, isn't this what it means to be a disciple? Isn't this... Every essence, everything that we do in the Christian life can fall into one of these eight. Every single thing. You name it, it falls in here somehow. It's essential. This is what they should be learning. So you as parents, you as grandparents, this is what you need to be gaining so you can give this to your kids. This is what it means to raise godly men, godly women in the faith. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. As we, as we drink deep and we take on some big ideas. Lord, I pray that you will spark things in the lives of these parents. Some of these teenagers, those who don't have children, look at this and realizing they're ahead of the game. They see this and they can begin now cultivating and growing. I pray you give them a vision. You will show them what they are lacking, that you will help fill that up, that you will help them to become fully equipped men and women of God, that they can transfer this to the next generation. They can transfer this, that if somebody came into this church, they placed their faith in Christ, that this church would have people who are trained, who know exactly what to do to make a new disciple. For Father, every time we bring a little baby into our home, we have been given one who needs to know the faith and be trained up as a man or woman of God. And across our churches, Across this world, we have failed radically. You've given us such precious gifts of children. May we honor that in becoming the fathers you've, and the mothers you've redeemed us to be, such that we can transfer to the next generation, and your church will be strengthened, and your church will again be the salt and light it's called to be in each community. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. Okay, I've got thumbs up. 10-minute break, which means there's coffee, there's other things. Get up, move around, stretch, get the blood flowing. We'll come back and we'll talk about virtuous fatherhood.